Chapter 9 of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Zokaitis. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikibu. Translated by Suyematsu Kenchou. Chapter 9 Hollyhock. The emperor has at last abdicated his throne, as he has long intended, in favor of the heir apparent, and the only child of the princess Wisteria is made heir apparent to the new emperor. The ex-emperor now lived in a private palace with this princess in a less royal style, and the nyogo of Kokiden, to whom was given the honorary title of ex-empress, resided in the imperial palace with the emperor, her son, and took up a conspicuous position. The ex-emperor still felt some anxiety about the heir apparent, and appointed Genji as his guardian, as he had not yet a suitable person for that office. This change in the reigning emperor, and the gradual advancement of Genji's position, gave the latter greater responsibility and he had to restrain his wandering. Now, according to usage, the Saigu and the Saim were selected. For the latter, the second sister of the emperor was chosen, and for the former, the only daughter of the lady of Dokjio, whose husband had been a royal prince. The day of the departure of the Saigu for Ise was not yet fixed, and the mind of her mother, who had some reasons for dissatisfaction with Genji, was still wavering in her indecision whether or not she should go to Ise with her daughter. The case of the Saim, however, was different, and the day of her installation was soon fixed. She was the favorite child of her mother as well as of her father, and the ceremonies for the day of consecration were arranged with especial splendor. The number of persons who take a share in the procession on this occasion is defined by regulations. Yet the selection of this number was most carefully made from the most fashionable of the nobles of the time, and their dresses and saddles were all chosen of beautiful appearance. Genji was also directed by special order to take part in the ceremony. As the occasion was expected to be magnificent, Every class of the people showed great eagerness to witness the scene, and a great number of stands were erected all along the road. The day thus looked forward to at last arrived. Lady Aoi seldom showed herself on such occasions. Besides, she was now in a delicate state of health, near her confinement, and had, therefore, no inclination to go out. Her attendants, however, suggested to her that she ought to go. It is a great pity, they said, not to see it. People come from a long distance to see it. Her mother also said, You seem better today. I think you had better go. Take these girls with you. Being pressed in this way, she hastily made up her mind, and went with a train of carriages. All the road was thronged by multitudes of people, many dressed in a style which is called tsubo shōzok. Many of great age prostrated themselves in an attitude of adoration, and many others, notwithstanding their natural plainness, looked almost blooming from the joy expressed in their countenances. Nay, even nuns and aged women from their retreats were to be seen amongst them. Numerous carriages were also squeezed closely together, so that the broad thoroughfare of the Ichijo road was made almost spaceless. When, however, the carriages of the Lady Aoi's party appeared, her attendants ordered several others to make way, and forced a passage to the spot where the best view could be obtained, and where the common people were not allowed. Among these happened to be two Ajiro carriages, and their inmates were plainly incognito and persons of rank. These belonged to the party of the Lady of Dokujo. When these carriages were forced to give place, their attendants cried out, 
these carriages do not belong to people who ought to be so abruptly forced away but the attendants of the lady aoi who were slightly under the influence of drink would not listen to their expostulations and they at last made their way and took up their position pushing the other two back where nothing could be seen even breaking their poles the lady so maltreated was of course extremely indignant and she would fain have gone home without seeing the spectacle but there was no passage for retiring meanwhile the approach of the procession was announced and only this calmed her a little genji was as usual conspicuous in the procession there were several carriages along the roads on whose occupants his glance was cast that of lady aoi however was the most striking and as he passed by the attendants saluted him courteously which act genji acknowledged what were the feelings of the lady of Dokujo, who had been driven back at this moment in due course the procession passed and the exciting scene of the day was over the quarrels about the carriage naturally came to the ears of genji he thought that lady aoi was too modest to be the instigator of such a dispute but her house was one of great and powerful families famous for overweening pride a tendency shared by its domestics and they for other motives also of rivalry were glad to have an opportunity of mortifying the lady of dokujo he felt for the wounded lady and hastened to see her but she under some pretext refused to see him the day of the hollyhock fate of the same temple came it was especially grand as it was the first one after the installation of the new saim but neither lady aoi nor the lady of dokujo was present while genji privately took violet with him in a close carriage to see the festival and saw the horse races we have already mentioned that the mind of the lady of dokujo was still wavering and unsettled whether or not she should go to ise with her daughter and this state of mind became more and more augmented and serious after the day of the dispute about the carriages which made her feel a bitter disdain and jealousy towards the lady aoi strange to say that from about the same time lady aoi became ill and began to suffer from spiritual influences all sorts of exorcisms were duly performed and some spirits came forth and gave their names but among them was a spirit apparently a living one which obstinately refused to be transmitted to the third party it caused her great suffering and seemed not to be of a casual nature but a permanent hostile influence some imagined this to be the effect of fearful jealousy of some one who was intimately known to genji and who had most influence over him but the spirit gave no information to this effect hence some even surmised that the wandering spirit of some aged nurse or the like long since dead still haunted the mansion and might have seized the opportunity of the lady's delicate health and taken possession of her meanwhile at the mansion of dokujo the lady when she was informed of the sufferings of lady aoi felt somewhat for her and began to experience a sort of compassion this became stronger when she was told that the sufferings of the lady aoi were owing to some living spirit she thought that she never wished any evil to her but when she reflected there were several times when she began to think that a wounded spirit such as her own might have some influence of the kind she had sometimes dreams after weary thinking between slumber and waking in which she seemed to fly to some beautiful girl apparently lady aoi and to engage in bitter contention and struggle with her she became even terrified at these dreams but yet they took place very often even in ordinary matters she thought it is too common a practice to say nothing of the good done by people but to exaggerate the bad 
and so in such cases if it should be rumoured that mine was that living spirit which tormented lady aoi how trying it would be to me it is no rare occurrence that one's disembodied spirit after death should wander about but even that is not a very agreeable idea how much more then must it be disagreeable to have the repute that one's living spirit was inflicting pain upon another these thoughts still preyed upon her mind and made her listless and depressed in due course the confinement of lady aoi approached at the same time the jealous spirit still vexed her and now more vigorous exercising was employed she became much affected by it and cried out please release me a little i have something to tell the prince hereupon he was ushered into the room the curtain was dropped and the mother of the lady left the room as she thought her daughter might prefer to speak to him in private the sound of the spells performed in the next chamber ceased and hokekyo was read in its place the lady was lying on her couch dressed in a pure white garment with her long tresses unfastened he approached her and taking her hand said what sad affliction you cause us she then lifted her heavy eyelids and gazed on genji for some minutes he tried to soothe her and said pray don't trouble yourself too much about matters everything will come right your illness i think will soon pass away even supposing you quit this present world there is another where we shall meet and where i shall see you once more cheerful and there will be a time when your mother and father will also join you ah oh, no i only come here to solicit you to give me a little rest i feel extremely disturbed i never thought of coming here in such a way but it seems the spirit of one whose thoughts are much disconcerted wanders away unknown even to itself oh bind my wandering spirit pray dear one nor let it longer stray the enunciation of these words was not of lady aoi herself and when genji came to reflect it clearly belonged to the lady of dokjo always before when any one had talked with him about a living spirit coming to vex lady aoi he felt inclined to suppress such ideas but now he began to think that such things might really happen and he felt disturbed you speak thus said genji as if he was addressing the spirit but you do not tell me who you are do therefore tell me clearly at these words strange to say the face of the lady aoi seemed momentarily to assume the likeness of that of dokujo on this genji was still more perplexed and anxious and put a stop to the colloquy presently she became very calm and people thought that she was a little relieved soon after this the lady was safely delivered of a child now to perform due thanksgiving for this happy deliverance the head of the monastery on mount hie and some other distinguished priests were sent for they came in all haste wiping off the perspiration from their faces as they journeyed and from the emperor and royal princes down to the ordinary nobles all took an interest in the ceremony of ubu yashinai first feeding and the more so as the child was a boy to return to the lady of dokujio when she heard of the safe delivery of lady aoi a slightly jealous feeling once more seemed to vex her and when she began to move about she could not understand how it was but she perceived that her dress was scented with a strange odor she thought this most surprising and took baths and changed her dress in order to get rid of it but the odor soon returned and she was disgusted with herself some days passed and the day of autumn appointments arrived by this time lady aoi's health seemed progressing favorably and genji left her in order to attend the court when he said good-bye to her there was a strange and unusual look in her eyes sadaijim also went to court as well as his sons 
who had some expectation of promotion, and there were few people left in the mansion. It was in the evening of that day that Lady Aoi was suddenly attacked by a spasm, and before the news of this could be carried to the court, she died. These sad tidings soon reached the court, and created great distress and confusion. Even the arrangements for appointments and promotion were disturbed. As it happened late in the evening, there was no time to send for the head of the monastery, or any other distinguished priest. Messengers of inquiry came one after another to the mansion, so numerous that it was almost impossible to return them all answers. We need not add how greatly affected were all her relations. As the death took place from a malign spiritual influence, she was left untouched during two or three days, in the hope that she might revive. But no change took place, and now all hope was abandoned. In due course the corpse was taken to the cemetery of Toribeno. Numerous mourners and priests of different churches crowded to the spot, while representatives of the ex-emperor, Princess Wisteria, and the heir apparent also were present. The ceremony of burial was performed with all solemnity and pathos. Thus the modest and virtuous Lady Aoi passed away for ever. Genji forthwith confined himself to his apartment in the great mansion of Sadaijim for mourning and consolation. Tō no Chūjō, who was now elevated to the title of Sammi, constantly bore him company, and conversed with him both on serious and amusing subjects. Their struggle in the apartment of Gennaishi, and also their recounter in the garden of the saffron flower, were among the topics of their consoling conversation. It was on one of these occasions that a soft shower of rain was falling. The evening was rendered cheerless, and Tō no Chūjō came to see him, walking slowly in his morning robes of a dull color. Genji was leaning out of a window, his cheek resting on his hand, and, looking out upon the half-fading shrubberies, was humming, Has she become rain or cloud? "'Tis now unknown. "'Tō no Chūjō gently approached him. "'They had, as usual, some pathetic conversation, "'and then the latter hummed, as if to himself. "'Beyond the cloud in yonder sky, "'from which descends the passing rain, "'her gentle soul may dwell, "'though we may cease to trace its form in vain.' This was soon responded to by Genji. That cloudy shrine we view on high, Where my lost love may dwell unseen, Looks gloomy now to this sad eye, That looks with tears on what has been. There was among the faded plants of the garden A solitary dindo nadeshiko. When Tō no Chūjō had gone, Genji picked this flower, and sent it to his mother-in-law by the nurse of the infant child, with the following. In bowers where all beside are dead, survives alone this lovely flower, departed autumn's cherished gem, symbol of joy's departed hour. Genji still felt lonely. He wrote a letter to the princess Momozono, Peach Gardens, he had known her long. He admired her, too. She had been a spectator with her father on the day of the consecration of the Saim, and was one of those to whom the appearance of Genji was most welcome. In his letter he stated that she might have a little sympathy with him in his sorrow, and he also sent with it the following. Many an autumn have I passed in gloomy thought, but none, I ween, has been so mournful as the last, which rife with grief and change hath been. There was, indeed, nothing serious between Genji and this princess, yet, as far as correspondence was concerned, they now and then exchanged letters, so she did not object to receiving this communication. She felt for him much, 
and an answer was returned, in which she expressed her sympathy at his bereavement. Now, in the mansion of Sadaijim, every performance of requiem was celebrated. The forty-ninth day had passed, and the mementos of the dead, both trifling and valuable, were distributed in a due and agreeable manner and genji at length left the grand mansion with the intention of first going to the ex-emperor and then of returning to his mansion at nijio after his departure sadaijim went into the apartment occupied till lately by him the room was the same as before and everything was unchanged but his only daughter the pride of his old days was no more and his son-in-law had gone too he looked around him for some moments he saw some papers lying about they were those on which genji had been practising penmanship for amusement some in chinese others in japanese some in freestyle others in stiff among these papers he saw one on which the words old pillows and old quilts were written and close to these the following how much the soul departed still may love to linger round this couch my own heart tells me even i reluctant am to leave it now and on another of these papers accompanying the words the white frost lies upon the tiles the following how many more of nights shall i on this lone bed without thee lie the flower has left its well-known bed and o'er its place the dews are shed as sadaijim was turning over these papers a withered flower which seems to have marked some particular occasion dropped from amongst them return we now to genji he went to the ex-emperor to whom he still seemed thin and careworn he had some affectionate conversation with him remained till evening and then proceeded to his mansion at nijio he went to the western wing to visit the young violet all were habited in new winter apparel and looked fresh and blooming how long it seems since i saw you he exclaimed violet turned her glance a little aside she was apparently shy which only increased her beauty he approached and after having a little conversation said i have many things to say to you but now i must have a little rest and returned to his own quarters the next morning first of all he sent a letter to sadaijim's making inquiry after his infant child at this time he confined himself more than usual to his own house and for companionship he was constantly with violet who was now approaching womanhood he would sometimes talk with her differently from the manner in which he would speak to a mere girl but on her part she seemed not to notice the difference and for their daily amusement either go or hensky was resorted to and sometimes they would play on till late in the evening some weeks thus passed away and there was one morning when violet did not appear so early as usual the inmates of the house who did not know what was the reason were anxious about her thinking she was indisposed about noon genji came he entered the little room saying are you not quite well perhaps you would like to play at go again like last night for a change but she was more than ever shy why are you so shy he exclaimed be a little more cheerful people may think it strange said he and stayed with her a long time trying to soothe her but to no effect she still continued silent and shy this was the evening of wild boar's day and some much pounded rice cake was presented to him according to custom on a tray of plain white wood he called kodemitsu before him and said to-day is not a very opportune day i would rather have them to-morrow evening do send in some to-morrow 
it need not be of so many colors. So saying, he smiled a little, and sharp Kodemitz soon understood what he meant. And this he accordingly did on the morrow, on a beautiful flower-waiter. Up to this time nothing about Violet had been publicly known, and Genji thought it was time to inform her father about his daughter. But he considered he had better have the ceremony of Mogi first performed, and ordered preparations to be made with that object. Let us here notice that the young daughter of Udaijin, after she saw Genji, was longing to see him again. This inclination was perceived by her relations. It seems that her father was not quite averse to this liking, and he told his eldest daughter, the reigning emperor's mother, that Genji was recently bereaved of his good consort, and that he should not feel discontented if his daughter were to take the place of Lady Aoi. But this the royal mother did not approve. It would be far better for her to be introduced at court, she said, and began contriving to bring this about. End of chapter 9